Well, good evening. It's time for us to jump back into our discussion from last week, in which we begin an introduction to the wisdom literature. Uh, remember, we basically covered our timeline that we had running through the Old Testament itself. Uh, we finished up as we looked at Ezra and Nehemiah uh, there at the very end, also around the same time contemporary would have been the writing of the Chronicles, Malachi, probably around that same time frame. So we worked our way all the way through, but I also wanted to make sure that we talked about the wisdom literature, which I think has a very important place uh, to play, part to play, when we look at and discuss um, really what the Hebrew Bible, uh, the, what we would call the Old Testament, is really all about. So much of it is teaching us, showing us how to live. Remember, what was the definition that we gave for wisdom? Thanks. Jonathan's the one that answered it last week, too. I think he gave the same amount of time before saying it last week. Like, let's see if some of these older folks are going to remember. No, nope, they're going to need me to pull the weight for them again this week, it looks like. So... Yeah, remember we talked about wisdom being skill in the art of godly living. And I think it's important that we look at it this way. Wisdom is a skill. In fact, the word wisdom in the Old Testament, that same word is used when it talked about skilled artisans, right? We talked about those who were building the tabernacle, who were wise in doing whatever it was that they were doing. They used the word for wisdom to talk about being skilled. What does it mean, though, to be skilled in the art of godly living? Someone want to take our entire discussion last week and boil it down into uh, five to ten seconds? Yeah, Julia. We don't have a microphone wandering around, do we? Yeah. All right, I'll try to do a good job of repeating back what you say. Go ahead. All right. Well, that was, that was very concise. I think you did it less than five seconds there. That living life in a godly way is not simply abiding by a list of do's and don'ts, but it is abiding life by the principles that we learn from the do's and don'ts, right? Wisdom is intricately tied to the law, the law being the place where God said, this is how to live. And in that law, we're not talking about the 613 specific commands that are given that we're supposed to follow each command, and that's how we live godly, but that in the various commands that are given, what we find are the principles of how to do this, how to do that, how to live the way that we're supposed to live. We can learn from laws about what happens when your, uh, your ox gores your neighboring farmer's ox, you know, and, and uh, causes damage, and, and you learn. How do you handle that? What do you do? Well, that's very specific, specifically talked about. But what if it's your dog that goes over and eats the chickens? How do you handle that? Yeah, Joshua? Find them new chickens? Yeah, it's the same thing, right? We understand the principles are in play because we, we, we say, okay, I understand how these rules affect living. It makes sense. I understand why you do this. I understand why you do that. I understand why each of these things work the way that they do. Therefore, I understand that I can take the principle and I can apply that principle. And I can even do so without having to use case law, right? You know what I mean by that, without having to use case law? I don't have to 
go and find book, chapter, and verse and say, well, because it says right here that the ox is supposed to be, you know, that if it's a first-time offense, then you're supposed to make restitution, but if it's a second-time offense, you're supposed to then kill the ox, and, you know, I don't have to do all of that necessarily. Go book, chapter, verse, look it up. Because I'm skilled, I understand it, I know the principles, and I know what to do in this scenario. I just understand it. I've meditated on the law. I understand the law. The law is a part of who and what I am so that the principles there will guide the way that I live my life. Yeah, Mary Martha. Yeah. And uh, if we don't understand God, I think part of the wisdom is is understanding what He wants mm-hmm. and desires from us. Yep, that's exactly right. And and the idea behind this is we don't lean on our wisdom, right? Because our wisdom is steeped in God's wisdom. You know, I I can do that without having to go to find book, chapter, and verse. Only if I have first meditated on the law to such a degree that it consumes me so that my wisdom becomes God's wisdom. Um, You know, what does he say in in the Psalms? Uh, Psalm, I'm going to get the wrong one. It's 37, I believe. But that could be 73. Remember, I said those are interchangeable. I'm almost positive. It's Psalm 37. And I want to say around verse 4. And it's an important, um, important verse to remember. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. That's uh, Psalm 37 and verse 4. That sounds like God just wants to give us anything that we want, doesn't it? Yeah, thank you, Joshua, that's right. But what's the key in that? The key is that you first and foremost delight yourself in the Lord. That you're from Psalm 1, the one who doesn't walk with the wicked, stand with the scoffers, sit with the mockers, right? But your delight is where? But his delight, the one who doesn't do that, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. That he becomes consumed with and filled with, so that his desires become attuned with. And they follow whose desires? God's desires. That's right, Joshua. So when our desires match God's desires, at that point, the Lord is more than willing to say, hey, what is your delight? That's my delight too. Let's do this together. And I think Mary Martha makes a very, very important point in in, uh, when we learn to live wisdom in our lives, our wisdom must first and foremost be foundationally rooted in the law of the Lord. And by that, again, I don't mean going to the law of Moses and finding those laws, but it is rooted in who and what God is, how God has shown himself, the principles that we find from God, that it is rooted in an understanding. You know, I was having a, a conversation, um, I guess, with, with Mike at some point where, you know, he, he, he said this, he has a tendency to do this, he says things that I say very succinctly, and a whole lot better and wiser than what I do. And I think that comes with age. Um, and he's got plenty of that for it to come. Um, so he says it, it's easier to teach a rule than a principle, right? I probably butchered what he said, but that's, that's kind of you know, what, what he said to that idea. It is a whole lot easier to tell someone what to do than it is to say, here is the idea behind it. That's what wisdom literature is all about. It takes the rules that are in play, 
But then it says, here's how to live those in a skilled way, like an artist. You are an artist in life because you're living the godly principles and they just exude from you. And when they do, are you going to make the right decisions? Are you going to do the right things? If you've meditated in the law of the Lord day and night and you're like, this is what God would want me to do and I just, I just know it. These are the ways that you'll make the right decisions in, life, in, in, in your life. This is being wise from a biblical sense. Um, so, all of that is kind of what we talked about last week. Just kind of catching things up. Questions about that from last week or further comments? Because now the big question is, and it's already up there because I put it to come up before I started in on the review, so um, how do we attain that kind of wisdom? Remember, we are talking about becoming artists. We're talking about people who are living life in such a way that, that we're like artisans. We want to get to the point where making the right decision, doing the right thing, being godly, is something that is second nature to us. We've, we've done all the things that we need to do to get to this position. Um, I think Emerson, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, is very helpful in this regard. Every artist was first an amateur. It's very important for us to remember that. I'm going to direct my thoughts to y'all here for just a moment. Hopefully, you guys live outside of your, yourself enough that you are able to look around and see some of these folks here who are older than you are, and you can see the wisdom in what they do, how they live, choices that they make. If you go and you talk with them, the things that they advise, that all of that, understand there was a point in time in which, maybe not literally, because I, I have no idea, but in a figurative sense, there was a time they sat in the very seats that you sit. And they looked around, and they saw the heroes of their day, the people that they went and talked to, the people that had that wisdom, the gray-haired folks of their day that they would go and discuss. And maybe some of you here are people who sat, again, not literally, I mean, maybe you did, I have no idea, maybe you sat right here in this area as younger folks, in these very pews, in these very ages, and you looked out, and maybe even some of the folks who are here were those people in those days, and maybe some of you really older folks, you remember when you were young, and there were those people that you looked up to, and that help to mold and to guide you. That is wisdom. You have to start as an amateur. None of us get zapped with wisdom and you're like, well, there you go, you got it. <laughs> you know, seven years old and you are the most wise person that's here, right? That doesn't happen with any of us. Jesus was pretty wise, I think, at the age of 12, that's the little snapshot that we're given of his youth. When he goes into the temple, he's an exception. He's not the rule, right? But as far as we are concerned, everyone begins as an amateur. Will Rogers is also helpful as well in helping us see that there are three ways that he says people can attain wisdom. There are three kinds of men, the one that learns by reading, the few who learn by observation, the rest of them have to pee on the electric fence for themselves. You gotta love Will Rogers and his way with words, right? Yeah, but it's so true. The way that, that he makes this observation. Um, I, don't, I don't have to explain this, right? Everybody gets this. Electric fences just aren't so foreign. You guys all... Okay, all right, so, so we're good there. All right, I didn't think about it. I was like, I really, I shouldn't, shouldn't have put it up there if I wasn't ready to explain it all, right? 
Here's the interesting thing about this. You will find all of these, maybe, I mean, not the specifics, but you'll find all of these within the wisdom literature itself. Wisdom literature is very specifically that first one. That is wisdom that is meant to be passed on by reading. That as you pour into the wisdom literature, you read through the Proverbs, you dig into the teacher in uh, Ecclesiastes, you, you look and you see what happens uh, with Job and his friends and their dialogues and, and all the outcome and everything involved with that. You read about wisdom and you can learn from it. And you can say, you know what, I've read this, I understand this, and I'm now going to shape my life by what it is that I've just read. And if you do that, you can avoid all kinds of pitfalls and problems. And that is going to help you. That is what it is there for. Wisdom to be passed on by reading or oration. I mean, initially all of these were meant to be read aloud so that people would hear them. As far as observation, the one that learns by reading, the few who learn by observation, the Proverbs are full of these kinds of observation statements. One could make uh, the argument, well, just with the Proverbs, you know, observe this, observe that, look at this illustration, that illustration. All kinds of ways of teaching and trying to help people to gain wisdom by looking at everyday, ordinary objects and things. One could make the argument that Job is meant to be for people to stand back and observe a very specific case of how people react to the way that God works in the world. That this is laid out for us to see how God and man work and the way that God works, and we get to stand back and observe it for ourselves and, and learn from that. And then the final, that is learning by experience, that's how Ecclesiastes begins. Ecclesiastes said, I set in my heart to test everything, to try everything. My conclusion that I got to was everything is vain, but I wanted to experience it all. I, I wanted to see what, 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 it will, um, what will drugs do for me? Alcohol, try to, you know, what, what's that going to do for me? Am I going to find enjoyment there? What about pleasuring, taking pleasure and women and things such as that, what can I find? What about building great monuments and gardens and things for myself? Does this bring that fulfillment to me that, I, that, that I'm looking for? Ecclesiastes is the wisdom, it's the writing of someone who sought out to learn wisdom by peeing on electric fences. He says, I'm going to do all the bad things that we're not supposed to do just to see if something works. If we can bring up Will Rogers again, again, he's just really good with the turn of phrase. He says, good judgment comes from experience. And a lot of that comes from bad judgment. That's the way experience works. <clears throat> a lot of times, people get to where they are in their understanding. People get to where they are in their wisdom. You can go to them, you can seek advice, you can get help from them, and they have really good stuff to say because they made an awful lot of bad decisions that they learned from in their life. And they did a lot of things bad. And I see some of you kind of nodding. I'm guessing you're nodding. I'm going to guess you're nodding because you've talked to someone who made bad decisions and you learned from them in that way, not because you've made bad decisions in your own life, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, the wisdom that is gained and that is learned because of bad decisions that have been made in the past. Every one of us, I'm going to assume, every one of us has learned in each of these ways. Is that fair? We've all learned by reading, we've all learned by observing, and we've all learned by making bad choices living with the consequences, and then learning from those. Yeah, Mary Martha? Okay. When you have the correct wisdom, you're letting go of pride. 
and sometimes pride takes over. You know, that's not what God appreciates is mm -hmm. pride of yourself and your own thinking. And if you have God's wisdom, you let go of that. Yeah, absolutely. And so much of the, the problems, the issues that we run into, and, and I put pride with another thing, selfishness. Um, they're not the same thing, but they go hand in hand very often, that a lot of the issues you run into is pride and simply being selfish, oftentimes because of that pride. That pride that says, I know the best, I know what I should do, um, I've got it all figured out. Interestingly enough, usually the people who feel like they've got it all figured out, at least it seems to me, um, are usually younger. Is, is that accurate? You're usually younger when you feel like you've got it all figured out? Yes. And that's because experience is what t teaches you yeah, you don't have it all figured out. And the older you get, the more that you realize you don't have figured out. The more you know, the more you know what you don't know, right? And I think Mary Martha is spot on. The first thing that really needs to go, the first thing that gets between you and God is your own pride. I mean, what does he say? John talks about, um, you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the what? The boastful pride of life. That's the issue. That is such a huge issue. And once you can get past yourself, let go. I, I like the way that Mary Martha said that. You get to the point where you can let go of that pride. That will open up wisdom to you. Basically, you get out of God's way and let God work, oftentimes, is what that is. Um, so seeking out wisdom, what we do is we seek out those who have been through life longer than we have, and we should be looking to them to help us. Um, I have submitted before, and I, I really stand by this, and I think the younger you are, the more important this is. Um, just here's my very brief synopsis. I, I've said it before, so I, I don't need to belabor this. There are three people that you need in your life. You remember who those three people are? Maybe I haven't said it enough. A Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy, right? You need that older Paul mentor person that you can go to, seek out, learn from. He will teach. He will guide you. You need to find a Barnabas in your life. What does Barnabas mean? Son of encouragement. You need that guy who's going to come up right beside you and give you the lift that you need when you need it, that he's going to be there to carry you through. And I mean, you need to have that encouragement in your life, but you also can't be a shell keeping all your wisdom to yourself. What else do you need? A Timothy. Somebody younger that you can then mentor and impart your knowledge, understanding, wisdom to. Those are the three people, and I think it's important that if you are younger, the, the sooner that you find a good Paul, and by the way, ladies, Paulina, I don't know how you, whatever you want to do with that, Paula, uh, whatever the case, as soon as you find that older mentor, the sooner that you do that, someone that, by the way, someone that you trust, someone that you know is going to give you good wisdom, um, not necessarily say the things that you want to hear, but the things that you need to hear. Find those people. Um, the better it's going to be for you. And when you get to a certain age, find those Timothys. You know, that moment when you look around and you're like, you know what, I, I don't consider myself part of the youngest crowd anymore. That's a weird, weird position to be in sometimes, Right? Some of you are like, yeah, I left that a long, long time ago, but there are others who aren't too far removed from being part of that young crowd, and you realize maybe I'm a little bit behind it. Find somebody to mentor. For those of you who have wisdom, 
you're older and you have it, don't hold that to yourself. Find the people. And again, not just you men. I'm not just talking to men here. Older ladies, instruct whom? The younger ladies. You know, that's some of the great wisdom that Paul had. He's writing to these young male evangelists, and he's like, hey, why don't you just let the ladies take care of the ladies? All right? Not your job. Just let the ladies take care of the ladies, and you can worry about how to instruct and talk to uh, the older men, the younger men, and such. But we need to seek out wisdom. Even then, we don't necessarily seek out every elderly individual, but we're really looking for mentors who are what? Just anybody who's old? All right, wise. Have you seen, have you ever come across, and, and I'm not looking for anybody to um, self-deprecate or anything like that here, you know, but there are older individuals who show absolutely zero wisdom. Have you ever come into contact with any of those people? It happens. Those are not the people that, if you're looking for wisdom, you want to seek out and search. What you're looking for, and this goes hand in hand with the conversation that we've been having about elders, what you're seeking are the people who exude godliness. They exude godly wisdom. The choices that they make, the fruit from their decisions, the things that they do, the way that they talk, the way they interact with people, you just say, that's a godly person. How did they get to be that way? Because they were an amateur at one point, right? How did they get to be where they are? They can help bring me to that point. That's a, that's a lot of what eldership is, looking for elders. You see people that are a certain path on the road to heaven, and they're way down in front of you. And what you're saying is, when I get to be their age, I want to be where they're standing now. I want to be on the path to heaven where they are, so I'm going to go to them and say, let me follow you. Show me how it is that I can follow Christ the way that you follow Christ. Which, by the way, is a biblical thing, right? To follow somebody who's following Christ. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that idea. Um, let's see, I need to be paying attention to this. Um, so, let me make sure I'm not skipping anything. All right, in general then, this is what the wisdom literature is all about, producing wisdom, producing skill, and the art of godly living. Um, this is not about living formulaically. This is not about creating a codified list of rules, a standard where you have lines drawn on every single thing and, and everything is, is written in stone. This isn't about living a formulaic life where you have instructions that tell you what to do. Being an artist and living biblically, living godly, is about instinctively knowing it because you got your training right here. You got your training in the Word of God. All right. Questions, comments, or thoughts on this before we move into the next section? Yeah, Joshua, what's your question, buddy? Um, we will go to Job. Um, I, I'm still not sure the order that I want to go through the books. We, we still need to talk about uh, Hebrew poetry before we move into one of the books. We're going to do an introduction, probably a one or two week introduction for every one of the wisdom books. There are five of them, and we will cover Job at some point. I just, I'm still debating if I want to start with Proverbs or because I think that that's kind of the standard for wisdom literature, or if I want to start with Job and just do them in order that we find them uh, within our canon. So, all of that, Joshua, to answer your question by saying, I don't know. Not immediately, though. All right. Anybody else before we transition? 
All right. Well, let's then talk about poetry. This should sound very familiar to a lot of folks because we are going to be rehashing here exactly. I mean, no changes whatsoever except where, you know, I I'm, don't remember verbatim what I said, but it's going to be the same discussion we had in our Psalms class. And it would be the same discussion we would start with if we did a week or a quarter on Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, because it is vitally important from the very beginning to understand what poetry is and why all of the Hebrew authors who wrote wisdom literature, why they used poetic language. All right. So what's poetry? Figure we should be able to get through this quickly because this is um, review. Yeah, Becky. Did you say concise art with words? I like that. I don't remember my definition either. Um, this, this is for discussion purposes, but I like that. Concise art with words. Because poetry is artistic. That's one of the qualifications for poetry. Um, yeah. Everyone else is like, I'm not going to follow that one. Anybody else wanting to give your definition of poetry? Like I said, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong. I mean, maybe there's a wrong. Um, if you were to say it's prose, I would be like, yeah, well, that's kind of the opposite, the other side of it. Uh, Joshua, what do you want to say, bud? Well, um, all of the wisdom literature, all, all the wisdom books use poetry, and they're going to be written using poetic language. Yep, very good. Kelly? Like making your point but not doing it directly. Okay. Using, using like language. But it's not usually very, it's, it can be precise, but I don't think it's very uh, concise. Yeah, well, sometimes, and sometimes not. And, and yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say. You guys almost seem to have definitions that are contradictory. One has taken the long route to get there. One is concise. Um, you know, but to that end, yeah, poetry can be either one, really. Um, yeah, Whitney? Words of expression. Okay. All right. Words that are used for expression. That is, um, they're not, as Kelly said, direct to the point, right? You're not just stating things. In fact, what is the language that we might use for words that just simply state reality? What kind of language? Not, well, not as prose typically is the style that is used for this, yes. Anybody remember the weird word? That is phenomenological language, where you simply express the phenomenon. That is, you simply express what is there. We might say, when I was, well, by the way, this, this that I'm pulling right now, this comes from C.S. Lewis. So this is not, you know, I, I didn't come up with this. Um, C.S. Lewis has a lot to say about poetic language and things such as that. But phenomenological language would say, it's cold outside. And if it were cold outside, which it's not right now, but if it were, if we went outside, we might say, oh, wow, it's cold out here, right? And would that be a true statement? Yeah, right? It'd be right. It's cold outside. Would it be exact? Not really. If we wanted exact, what kind of language would we use? 
Okay, but what, what is that? What type of language? Yeah, this is scientific language. We might say it's 31 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Now, if we said that, are we being exact? Yeah, we've gone beyond just a phenomenological occurrence. Now, we're dealing with an exact scientific statement. This has nothing to do with how you feel, right? This has nothing to do with the way that you interact and what your emotional state or anything else is with it. Um, this is an exact statement. Poetic language, though, might be something like this. Ah, bitter chill it was. The owl for all his feathers was a cold. The hare limped, trembling through the frozen grass, and silent was the flock in woolly fold. Numb were the beadsman's fingers while he told his rosary, while his frosted breath like pious incense from a censer old seemed taking flight for heaven without a death, past the sweet virgin's picture, while his prayer he saith. The Eve of St. Agnes by John Keats. What's he describing? It's cold, right? I mean, that's what he's describing. A scene in which it's cold, that's... That's all that this is really describing. And he does so by talking about the owl, the hare, the, the silent flock, and the beadsman, who obviously for John Keats and, and his Catholic background is uh, praying his rosary while his breath is, is coming out because it's so cold, right, that his breath is manifest in front of him and uh, he says, like, it's taking a flight for heaven. Even though there's not a death, the spirit is still going up. Um, can you see the picture of cold from these words? This is poetic language. This is artistic, to go with Becky's statement. And like Kelly said, it's not direct. It's not phenomenological. We're not talking, he doesn't say it's cold but he paints a picture for us by which we can see this. Um, why would somebody, why might somebody use poetic language? Why, when we get to the wisdom literature, why do they say we should do wisdom literature and poetry? Yeah, Jan? Okay, Jan... All right, Jane says, it's like painting a picture with words, like the parables. It helps us to see a picture. All right, Kelly? I was going to mention the parables, too, because when his disciples said, why are you, why are you teaching them in parables? And he says, if the people that want to figure it out, they're going to figure it out. And everybody else, you're just going to read it and say whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, go ahead. They, if they want, if they're willing to dig, they're going to find it. Yeah, I, and I think there's absolutely something to that. I, I don't have it on here, uh, but remember when we um, looked at the passage from the Proverbs about drinking from your own cistern, right? And not going out. And, you know, we were talking about how is, is that, is that a passage that is talking about where to get your water in the morning? No. It's painting a picture that says, hey, stay true to the wife of your youth, right? Stay true to the one wife that you've made a commitment. Don't go after other cisterns out there because it later says, why should you find pleasure in anybody else? Stay true and firm to your wife but it paints it um, in that kind of a picture by which you have to work for it a little bit in order to understand. Yeah, Mary Martha? When I was a, a child, um, I really had a hard time with this. And so I said to my father, I said, um, I just don't understand poetry at all. 
And he giggled and he says, well, you're a realist. And uh, <laughs> he says, it's a person's observation. It's another person's observation mm -hmm. on a situation. And so I had to say, well, then I have to think like them. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it was difficult to, um, you know, like, okay, it's cold outside, you know, like you were saying. Yeah. But then somebody else will picture what they have seen or observed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's one of the elements, I think, that makes poetry so powerful, is that you do have to step out of yourself. Um, one of the things that it forces, poetic language forces you to slow down. You can't just barrel through it. And you can't just be like, uh, just, just kind of read through it. You have to stop and say, what is this really saying? What is he trying to get across here? That is not the way that I would say this. This is not the way that I would word this. Sometimes I wish they'd just give it to me plainly, right? That's what they said to Jesus, right? Just tell us plainly. And he's like, I already told you. I've already given you everything that you need, but like Kelly said, um, you have to work for this. You have to figure this out. You have to use some time with it. It uses a lot of figurative language, uh, language by which you, you look at it and it's not necessarily saying what the words on the page are saying. Using phrases like cistern to talk about other women or, or women, I guess. So you drink from your own sister and don't go out to others that are out there. You know, this is figurative language that's being used. Um, poetry also is artificial. Um, and this, this gets to exactly what Mary Martha was saying just a second ago. It's not going to just give you precise language uh, man, I love the way that you said that because it was so funny, but it was spot on. You mean, I, I'm gonna say, did you say, you mean I have to think like them? Or is, did you say something like that? Yeah. Um, and that, that's it. it. It uses artificial language. It, it says things in the ways that we would not typically say them. Um, boy, I meant to have a songbook up here. Um, I haven't, it's been, it's been too long, let's see. All right, I should have known this one. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am and wait not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with, with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive. Thou wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because of thy promise. I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. Isn't that powerful language? Who here speaks that way on a normal basis? But when it's done well, and it's done artistically, and it's placed in these kinds of ways, and it's artificial, word choice is absolutely crucial. You talk to anybody, talk to Cliff, talk to Dale, others here who may have written songs before, talk to people who are poets, and ask them, hey, how much time do you spend on each word? And they will tell you, oh, there are some words I went through about 50 to 60 words before I found the one that felt right. And even then, I changed something up here, so I had to come back to this one again and rework it. Is that fair? 
Is that accurate? Because every word is crucial. Everything matters. You, you keep working it and reworking it to try to get the absolute best that you're trying to get across because you're not just making a statement. You are creating art. You're creating something that transcends the regular statement. You're, you're saying something that has a meaning that's up here on a higher level. That's what poetry does for us. It takes time. It takes meditation to read through this, to look at it, and to understand it. You can't just do it. You can't just read it. When things are written in poetry, they're saying, hey, this is important enough. You need to slow down and think about this. Like I said, word for word, right? We talked about this. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. We have a song, right? As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Yeah, it's a nice, pretty song. What's the picture that's being painted here? Oh, it's not a deer drinking water. It's a deer that wants to drink water. But what's wrong? There is no water. The deer is dying. This is the picture of a deer that is panting. It needs water. It's a dying deer because there is no water. And, and it's going to completely dehydrate and die there on the spot if it doesn't receive water from the book, from the brook. And the author says, that is me if I don't have you, O Lord. If I don't have access to you, I'm like a dead, or I'm like a dying deer panting. That's how much I need you. That's the picture that is being painted. All right, very, very briefly, because we don't need to go into this, Hebrew poetry uh, is a kind of a specific form. They have their own ways of doing things, unlike many other types of poetry. Um, remember, when we try to rhyme, what do we rhyme usually in poetry? The ending of words. And so we, we make things that, that sound good. Uh, for them, the way that it's been explained to me, they rhymed thoughts. Repetition, repeating ideas over and over in what's called parallelism. I'm not going to go into all the different types of parallelism. If you were in our Psalms class, we did so. Um, I think this is sufficient for what we are accomplishing here uh, and, and what it is that we're talking about. Any questions as far as poetry is concerned or further comments from anybody? And why, when you think about wisdom, wisdom is an elevated concept, isn't it? It's artistic. Wisdom is something that is high above us. It transcends the normal way of living. Wisdom is on its own other level, therefore, the language that's used for wisdom is on its own level as well. And that's why poetry within the scriptures, poetry is very often connected with wisdom. And by the way, it's also very often connected, especially in the prophets, with whose words? Who says a lot in the prophets? God, thus saith the Lord. And then usually, very often, it's poetic language is the way that God's words are transcribed and given to us. Again, because he transcends, therefore the language that is used also transcends normal language. It's loftier, it's higher, it's greater, and it's worth meditating on. All right. Comments or questions before we conclude then this evening? All right. Do you have anything? All right, so there's no new information um, as far as Richard is concerned. Just one more reminder. Don't come here on Wednesday night, but be here on Thursday night. Um, I'm sure Scott would really appreciate if everybody who's here right now was here again coming back 
Uh, and I think that uh, we will all appreciate taking the opportunity to be here on Thursday night. Scott Ruman from Bend is going to be uh, doing our lesson in our series entitled, Do Not Be Afraid. All right? Well, there's nothing else. Why don't we conclude with a prayer together? If you'll bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for every blessing that we have. We thank you for the wisdom that you have granted to us through your word. Be with us, help us to um, meditate on your word, to learn it, to love it, to live it in our lives. Help us to pass that wisdom on to others and help us to attain wisdom from others and from your word so that we can live to the praise of your glory. We thank you for Jesus, who was a wiser than Solomon, who was the wisest of all, who uh, not just knew how to live, but he demonstrated it in everything that he says and does. And we thank you that he was our sacrifice, that he has given us hope, and that he now reigns as our king, our Lord, our Savior. We thank you for Jesus, and it's through him we pray. Amen.